Hello and welcome to Creative Ghettos, the show that explores various creative industries and profiles the Africans who push them forward. Each week I spend 30 minutes unveiling excellent and inspiring individuals within creative industries, including but not limited to fine art, architecture, design, food, film and publishing. My name is Gwane Lukunene. Thank you for joining me right here on brandlive.co.za. Nigerian author Ben Oki once wrote that great leaders understand the power of the stories they project to their people. They understand that stories can change an age and turn an era around. The same can be said of Uno Deval, owner and publisher of Between 10 and 5, South Africa's largest online creative showcase. He's a great leader in communicating the South African creative's narrative, in turn making it easier for the world to connect to some of the most phenomenal thinkers and doers of our generation. Una, welcome to Creative Ghettos. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you for, for great coming. Info. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, briefly, I, I really want to know what the Uno Deval story is. A little bit of your personal background. Background. Okay, well, I think, um, I suppose it started at the, at the start with the parents. Uh, my parents have always been, um, I suppose, entrepreneurial and kind of creative in their endeavors. So... Uh, my father's a lawyer. He started as a law company ages ago, a law firm ages ago. And he's always, it's, it's astounding. I, I sometimes think that he was one of the early tech pioneers um, with when it, came, when it comes to law. Um, it's just kind of disrupting the industry or finding better ways to do things. Um, and then my mother has always been um, kind of, she was one of the early millennials, I'd say, in terms of like hopping between different jobs. Um, she's had about <laughs> 20 different careers in her lifespan, ranging from property development to theater, PR, um, and a lot of other design um, kind of elements too. So I think I have a creative edge from or creative kind of background from them and an entrepreneurial background from them. It's I've always kind of thought to work for myself. Um, I grew up in Cape Town. Um, Originally from Bloom, uh, ah, all places, okay. yeah. Moved cool. when I was three, though, so I see myself as a Cape Townian. Um, I was quite involved in a lot of music culture when I was younger, um, knowing the people that are throwing parties, going to them, that kind of thing. Um, and then I went to Stellenbosch, uh, where I think also at school I was quite a, like, I think outspoken or kind of rah-rah. I was... Um, you naughty. Like, Were you naughty? A bit of both, yeah. <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of both. Part of like the societal thing that the school does and then also kind of anti-establishment. Okay. Um, and then at university, I went to Stellenbosch and um, I immediately rejected a lot of the values that they had. Uh, I was in one of the reses there and I just hated it. Mm. Um, but I still kind of saw it as an interesting world to operate inside of, um, but very much on the outside of what was going on there at the time. Um so then I kind of lost that whole rah-rah thing of like, let's all bandy together and do stuff. And it wasn't really my thing. But um, I still joined, the, oh, I, I was the media and marketing head for the student council there. Um, part of a lot of societies. And then shortly after that, I joined, uh, at that point, Web 2.0 was a big thing. So blogging started becoming big. Um, the internet kind of found its, its This was feet. about 2000 and... Uh, well, that was 2000 to 2000, matriculated 2002. Okay. Um, so 2005, I'd say, I was part of the student council. And um, I started blogging and writing a bit and kind of chatting to other thought leaders in the space at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And there were like some people that are huge names now. Um, uh, Mike Stop. Firth, Nick Arambus, uh, Dave Duarte, all those dudes. Um, we started kind of had a, a couple of blogs that we were writing on each other, commenting and, and so on. And then that kind of got me into Web 2.0 yeah. um, and kind of the birth of the Read Write Web um, and getting people to have an opinion and, and, and kind of showcasing that or kind of say being able to express that opinion online yeah um i started working at a company called acceleration which is a media or like a media services company they do email marketing and display advertising that kind of thing um and i i had this foot in with um with media but i was never in advertising per se i was never mm. like an advertising person it was more kind of implementing at the time that the buzzword was knowledge 2.0 which is a um, uh knowledge sharing uh, a way to share knowledge inside a inside a company mm. and um from there i went to media 24 i went to uh, 24.com uh, when my internship was done and we I joined to start uh, a Facebook competitor. Can you believe it? Uh, oh, that Nas is excellent. Nas yeah, Naspash once had started this Facebook social network competitor because they realized social networking was going to be big. 
um, and they gave us a, a year budget of what Facebook spends in a day, I think, uh, to produce this thing. So obviously didn't didn't go down too well. Um, the budget was supposed to last you how long? Twelve years? Oh no, it was terrible. It was actually what they thought they could spend on on something was uh, was horrendous. I had <laughs> one developer, half a designer, um, so it was it was never really going to go anywhere. Yeah. But we managed to to, to buy one or two companies through Nasper mm -hmm. uh, or through Media Twenty Four dot com. Um, I left then, uh, kind of midway through, and then I. I thought, well, let me let me do my own thing. Let me. I know a little bit of web design and development, or how to build things. Mm. Um, and I've always been a hacker, I think, at heart. Um, so power to the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we built. Uh, we started a small company, me and two friends, um, called uh, Max Rover. That was a research and strategy company. We started it without knowing the stitch of research or strategy, really. Mm. Um, and through that, we started presenting to some clients. We had to do a lot of research, and this is 2006, I think, 2007, seven, eight, more or less. Yeah. Um, 2007, yeah. Um, and we had to find research for other companies. We had to find um, what were toothpaste brands doing on social media in 2007? What were TV ads that were flighting? What was culture like um, that brands could tap into? So the idea is that you kind of pull on all these resources and that allows you to um, build advertising campaigns with with all these references. You kind of see what's happening in culture, what's happening in media, what other competitors are doing. So you had doing. to be immersed in this cultural yeah. and, uh, um, experience and yeah. youth culture specifically. Yeah, but mainly like it was, you had to find it and that was really hard. It was really mm. difficult to know what was happening in Joburg if you were sitting in Cape Town. Um, There's no central place to pool all that information together. Mm. So we started 10 5 one, I think, September um, 2008 um, and it's really just a kind of um, have a place to put all this information on. Have a place where we can put the things that we've seen that our friends are doing in one place yeah. so we can easily reference it again for another research campaign. And we said, um, we asked our friends to share with us between five and ten things that they're doing at the moment. Oh, that's, that's where it. the name comes that's, from. That's the thing. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. So the idea is show me between five and ten things, less than five and it's too little, more than ten and it's, and it's too much. Yeah. Um, and we registered and we just started publishing on a daily basis. Um, it wasn't really a business at the time, so I got an opportunity to come and work at uh, DSTV in Joburg, so I moved up. And I ran the site as a part-time thing over that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got a salary and I paid an editor to run the site. Um, Alex, Alex Rose Cowie, she ran, she was our editor at the start of things. And when it was at DSTV, I worked on Vuzu, Channel O, MK and CakeNet, all the niche channels. Uh, what were you doing there? Um, so I helped them build their social communities, kind of figure out what are they doing with content? Um, how do they engage with online communities? How do you distribute content online as well? Mm. And what do people want um, from a content, big content provider like a Channel O or a Vuzu? So it's quite exciting. We got to play with some um, cool TV shows, uh, young upstart kind of content brands. Um, then from there, I got an opportunity to go work at um, Isobar, which is a big multinational um, digital ad agency mm. uh, where I headed up social, so the social media division there. And then I got to work with brands a lot more. So on the DSTV side, I got to work with kind of content and publishing and distribution of content and audiences. And then at uh, Isobar, I got to work on Nike, Red Bull, Nokia, um, a whole bunch of really, really interesting brands. And we, we sold content campaigns to a lot of the brands. And it was just when the internet was uh, kind of like short format video was was booming, um, sort of beautiful videos for, for like Celsi and Nike and all those guys. And um, at that time, I realized that in order for me to take 10 or 5 where I wanted to go, it was about five years old, old at the time. Um, and we had we weren't making any money. Um, it was a great labor of love. Um, I was still paying the editor from my salary. So, you know, you get your salary, take off tax, and then from that I wow. paid the, the editor. Wow. Um, and we, what was she doing? She was to... sourcing stories. So no, finding... no, I mean, was that enough for her to, to keep going? Or was she, like, really young and didn't have a lot of yeah, yeah, quite bills young. to pay? Okay, yeah, yeah. cool, because I'm a... so concerned concerned about her right now yeah, yeah no she's doing very well for herself <laughs> okay uh, she's actually editor for another online food magazine ah moment. excellent yeah, yeah no she's doing great um i hope alex if you're out there hope you're doing great <laughs> um but um yeah so so kind of built the site or mm -hmm. built the built the brand but it didn't it wasn't a business yet and i realized in order for us to take the opportunities that are coming to us i had to be in the business full-time i had to 
do 10 or 5 full time. That needed to be the only kind of source of income. Because also over the previous years, I was always kind of one foot in and one foot out. Um, 10 or 5 was taking over, kind of building it a little bit, meeting with people, doing some campaigns on the side, but not really taking the opportunities that were presented to us and really exploiting them. Mm. So I said, cool, let's do this thing. I quit quit my job. And then three months later, I was out. Um, we didn't have one client or any oh funds word. in the bank. That is the worst. No, it is rough. And also yeah. that's when you kind of realize, oh, this is how these businesses make money. It's on 45-day payment terms after the campaign is done and you've paid everyone already. And uh, managing cash flow is the thing. Managing yeah. staff is the thing. Hiring up, scaling up, all those kinds of things. And, are, and, you, had are things. and you had no clue about all no those things. No clue of all those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's learning on the job for you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so 10 and 5 covers quite an extensive selection of subjects. Um, you can mm -hmm. find almost anything from art, film, and fashion to typography and product design why was it important to tackle the creative world in such a vast manner so there's a there's a lot of sayings that um a lot of kind of people that have said you shouldn't be inspired advertising shouldn't inspire advertising and in the same way art should not inspire yes. art it comes from other things yes. so so you can't be a great fashion designer um and only look at fashion yes. that's not where great work comes from we have to see lots of other things that are happening so we want you to come in on maybe a beautiful new lookbook that uh, someone has released, but then you see technology and you see art and you see music and those things inspire you more and you pull on those different resources and different inspiration uh, legs or insp pieces of inspiration to do something new. And maybe that inspires a whole new range of clothing or music or whatever it might be that, you, that you're busy producing. So we never wanted to be only about one thing or mm. only about advertising and since we started we actually published quite a, quite a lot less advertising um, and it's because it's important to have one central destination I think to see what's happening in the creative industry yeah. um, and also as people are more fluid in their careers they might be in advertising right now and then later on they're an artist. Or and I love how when you go onto the site things that you know i think art is some it's like a go-to area for a lot of people in fashion but when you go onto your site you're not hiding things like product design no. to, to making it a subcategory in, in no. some obscure place on the website you know when you get on you you might just bump in the first thing you bump into might be some article about absolutely. a typographer or absolutely or whatever yeah yeah absolutely and i think we kind of see everything on equal footing yes mm. there are certain articles and certain types of articles that do a lot better so we have a huge community of graphic designers and they love the typography <laughs> and oh this kerning is amazing <laughs> Uh, and then by the same token, you have a cinematographer who also comes to the site to see what great music videos yeah. are out there. And they don't give a damn about the kerning or whatever, yeah. you know? So it's, um, but they still can see the kind of inspiration and reference. Of, of but it's that. amazing how, um, you know, when you have certain people, especially the creative market, coming onto the website and just seeing how they think about things. And, yeah. and it's almost as if they feel as if they've been starved of their own yeah. world for a long time. You know, time. I think when we started, there was no place to see this stuff. Honestly, mm. there was no place where you could see um, like a new music video that was being released. You could only see that if you were watching TV um, or if you happened to stumble across it on, on YouTube. Um, yeah. Facebook didn't have the news feed as we know it now. Um, if there was an illustration piece that you would have done for an international magazine, no one would, literally no one else in South Africa would see that. Um, or a billboard that goes up in downtown Joburg mm. that looked amazing, it was a part of a great campaign. If you were not part of that campaign or in, intentionally marketed to you, you wouldn't have seen that. Mm, mm. And we think that it's important to have this cross section of, of the creative world. Like if you didn't have, if you didn't manage to get to the Joburg art fair, you wouldn't have seen the work that was there. Unless yeah. you were reading the magazine at a specific time for that issue, you wouldn't have seen it. Um, so it is important for us to have inspire lots of people um, with lots of different types of creative work out there. Yeah. So 10 and 5 has collaborated with big international brands such as yep. Adidas, Ford and MTN. How do you fuse the ideas of creatives with such mainstream avenues without giving up the integrity of the initial uh, creative up output? It's a it's a difficult um, thing, and it's a, I think it's something that needs to get unpacked by a lot of creatives. Um, two years ago, we launched our own advertising agency or kind of content studio um, yeah. called Studios, 
Um, and in studio, we developed content for brands that they could then use on their platforms or we would produce an event for them or a campaign in general that didn't touch 10 or 5 at all. Mm. Um, and it did, it did fairly well. Um, people, brands would come to us because we were kind of in the know about who's doing what, what is culturally relevant for um, the creative market at the moment. Um, and um, But we, in the past year, we've started doing less and less of that kind of work and more things that are true to us, um, things that we feel are important to do. So what we do now is we develop our own shows or concepts and then we get brands to buy into that. So it's more ah. of a sponsorship model than a, um, please, can you do this for us? Yeah. Because the, to be honest, the those kind of campaign production things and the, and the world where you create campaigns for brands and it's purely about them, um, it's not great it's it's just creating another piece of advertising and we actually in the business of creating culture rather than creating another piece of advertising because culture is long-standing way more way yeah. more yeah. yeah so i think we we don't want to create just another tv campaign or mm. just another kind of piece of content we want to create something that is um very true to what we stand for as 10 of 5 in terms of like being representative uh saying the right things um talking to the right people and i think it's it's when we have our own thing, it's way easier for us to tell a brand, sorry, this is these are our kind of guidelines and this is uh, where you stop and we are where we start. Mm. So it's it's difficult. Not a lot of brands um, get that. Um, and even some like forward-thinking brands um, where they are part of our world or there might be an art a brand that is in the, that is in the art world, mm. they still kind of want to push the brand down, down people's throats and we don't like that. Because of commercialization. Well, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so, you know, we're going to take a short break. Um, we'll have more with Una Duval after this. Have you ever thought about the power of social media? Social media has the power to make your business grow. Grow! Yeah. Why don't you let us manage your social media? Because our business is to see your business grow. Visit us at www.beastownmedia.co.za. You're listening to brandlive.co.za. An industry first in the world of internet radio. Not only are we an internet radio station, we are an internet radio platform for your brand. So why not expose your brand to potentially thousands of listeners and improve your customer relationships and brand equity with podcasts and live broadcasts? Be sure to check brandlive.co.za for more information. Brandlive.co.za, harnessing the power of internet radio. You're listening to brandlive.co.za. Welcome back to Creative Ghettos. I'm still chatting to Uno Duval, the genius behind online magazine dedicated to creatives between 10 and 5. Um, before the break, we were still talking about the mainstream. Um, the one thing that I've realized is that mainstream almost neglects creative industries to the point that reading or even casually speaking about these subjects become niche and unattainable. Why do you think this is so? You know, I think um, a lot of people see creators as being out there. You know, they're the weird, wacky, <laughs> wacky kids. Um, but when you look at kind of impact in underground culture um, and impact that that underground, underground culture has on mainstream society, um, it's huge. Mm. Um, rave culture comes from um, a very oppressed uh, group of people like ages ago that were trying to party and develop new music styles and, and express themselves. And now it's a, it's a massive part of, of mainstream society. Mm. And I think what we what we try and do with 10 of 5 is, is almost be able to bridge that gap. Um, so there's a lot of other publications that do kind of like the very young, emerging, very trendy um, um, creatives. And mm. we, we also profile them, but we try and make it a little bit more accessible and appeal and, and kind of, um, I say like, we, we, we try and get to that... M early majority um we we're not the like super young super super like bleeding edge people and uh, we do feature them as well but we also kind of try and make it accessible for trying to make creativity and the creative industries a lot more accessible for kind of a mainstream market if that makes makes sense but i think that the creative world is still a bunch of or the perception is that they are you know they get high all the time and <laughs> sleep late and don't mm. deliver work and there is that in a lot of other industries as well so mm. i think um 
Maybe just everyone must just work with a few more creatives. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, what do you think the reality of there being uh, struggling artists or creatives exists? And what do you think can be done to change things? A lot of that struggling artist um, kind of world is because of the commercial commercialization of services and products. Um, yeah. I don't think that... Um, creatives can necessarily understand how to commercialize their what it is that they do. Mm. Um, and look, I think a lot of the time it is because they are not aware of how to sell themselves. Um, and I think that people do need a lot more training in how that works, but also because people are, creatives have a passion for what they do and they don't want to sell out. They don't want to slap a brand um, image on any a brand logo on, on everything that they do yeah. or create something for people to buy that is not true to them. Yeah. Um, and I think that creatives must also get off their high horse a little bit more and, and be willing to make a piece of artwork that might not necessarily be uh, you know, the, the in line with in line with them, but yeah. is commercially viable. And you mm. see the artists that are successful do that, and that allows artists to be able to do the thing that they really want to do. So, what we often do is um, find a happy medium between us and the client that we're working with, mm. and then, I, I mean, in, in essence, ten and five is entirely funded through the profits that come off those those works. So, and that allows us to do whatever the hell we want in ten and five, mm. um, and because we have that kind of duopoly we can do something like that so it's important to do the thing that makes the money and then use that money to do the passion that you that you the thing that you're passionate about within the same space within the same space yeah, yeah, but yeah. Find that's, a, that's always the trick um mm -hmm. because a, lo a lot of people are doing other things that have com nothing at all to do with what the yeah. passion is but if you're in the same space then you yeah. can have that balance yeah and i think there's there's something one can learn from kind of economic theory and uh, in terms of price discrimination you know how people charge different things for different prices mm. um like an iphone is always the example an iphone 16 gig a 32 and a 64 gig the actual cost of that 64 versus the 16 gig is not that much more like to the real cost to put that, okay. that, that data, that memory in. Yeah. But they use that to price discriminate, to have someone who's willing to pay 20,000 Rand for a phone. So they're going to, they're going to make a phone that is, is that much money. Uh, it's going to cost that much. And then they're going to make a phone that's 5,000 Rand because someone else is willing to pay 5,000 Rand. But if they price it at 20,000 Rand, then you're not going to be able, they're going to miss out on a whole bunch. Yeah, big a whole section, huge market. A whole big, you know, yeah. massive market. Yeah. So they use different price points to do that. And I think that creatives can do the same. A lot of fashion designers do that, actually. They have one range that is the kind of ready-to-wear thing that's off the runway and like mass-produce that. Mm. And then they have other products that are more bespoke and more niche and, and have a much higher price point. And that then drives up the value for their, for their ultimate, for their, for their brand, really. Mm. So I think... The, brand, the, the creators that get that and understand how that thing works, they are successful. You can't just make one thing and think that's the thing that people are going to buy. You have to understand what people are willing to pay for what it is that you are producing. Okay. And, um, you know, speaking about not wanting to to put a brand on what you do, uh, you know, there's a there's, there's a there's a person I know who, who's, who's also creative. He, he's an artist, actually. And he was talking about how um, he was comparing himself to, he's more well-established, and he was mm. comparing himself to to upcoming artists, saying that he wishes he was at that point in his career again because yeah. he had much more freedom to to do whatever it is that he yeah. wanted, as opposed to now yeah. where the world is basically dictating to him that mm. this is what you should be producing. Yeah. Uh, do you stumble across that quite often? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of kind of pigeonholing in... Um in the creative world, you know, because you, you're the person that takes these kinds of photos. Therefore, mm. I come to you for those kinds of photos. I don't want you to do anything else. And but that how do you often, break out of that? That's difficult. I think that um, you have to do your own passion projects as well. So if yeah. you start doing one specific type of uh, work, you'll get known for that kind of work. And it is really difficult to break out of that mold. Mm. Um, but I have a, a friend now who's an illustrator, um, who's kind of built his career as an, as an illustrator and as a conceptual designer. And lately he's started to do photography. And I think that's now he's becoming known as a photographer as well. Okay. But he did do, he invested in that time himself. Yeah. Um, he didn't say, cool, let me sell you this photography because clients didn't, clients didn't want to buy the photography from him before. But now that he's shown that he can also do that, they're also buying that from from him as well so you have to 
put in a little bit of investment if you want to break out of that mold mm. um, and do something else. What could you detail as some of the most crucial things that you experienced which shaped who you've become now? Um, I think it is taking that leap to do 10 or 5 yeah. full time. That was definitely one. And then um, selling the first big campaign, like selling and producing the first big campaign gives you a real kind of eye opener with around everything, how to deal with um, suppliers, how to deal with the client, how to manage your cash flow, um, how to you know take that thing and sell it again uh, or package it as a case study. Um, and those things, I think, kind of give you like really stick you in the trenches. Mm. Um, and I think that through that, you learn how to do stuff. Then there's kind of working with people as well. Like how do you manage people and how do you get people to buy into the vision that you are busy building? Mm. Um, because ultimately, you know, my, my job is not, I don't write the content. I don't source it. I don't um, distribute or deliver it. Um, I build a system that does that. Okay. So um, I'm not the most hip and trendy and with it person. Like <laughs> well, I, you think. <laughs> I can't. I can't be that. Like yeah. I, it's 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 impossible for one person to know everything that's happening. It has to be a system for how that how how we source content and how we source ideas and things that are happening out there and how that gets distributed um, back out again. Um, and I think that's been one of the biggest learnings for me lately is, is to see how can we build this thing so that it doesn't rely on individual people in the, in the, the, the stream, in the stream. Yeah. You know. Um, any plans of a 10 and five Nigeria, Tanzania? Or Actually, yes. African yeah, absolutely. Country? We, it's definitely on our cards, um, to do a lot more work across the continent. Yeah. Um, so we are looking for contributors so if there are any contributors listening from uh specifically nigeria ghana and kenya we'd love to hear from them um so and i think that there's there's a booming creative industry and um, there's a lot of attention on the creative world uh the creative industries uh, in africa at the moment mm. um and i think that in a lot of ways those industries are where we were 10 years ago yeah, um, yeah. they don't have the platforms um there are gr there's great work being done by the likes of designing darba natal is doing work um okay africa is also doing yeah. great work and i think um there's space for all of us to do what it is that we do mm -hmm. um and i think uh you know i i hope to see more kind of uncovering of this creative world um across the rest of the continent so hopefully 10 or 5 can contribute to that yeah. great Thank yeah. you so much, Uno. Thank you. Thank you for stepping in today and sharing a piece of your life and thoughts with the world. Uh, check out the most influential creative magazine in South Africa between 10 and 5 on 10and5.com as well as on the Gram, Facebook and Twitter. To find out more about the Africans who drive various creative industries forward, make sure to follow Creative Ghettos on Instagram at Creative Ghettos. My name is Gwane Lekunene. Join me again next week, Friday from 2 to 2.30 p.m. for another impactful show. Bye for now. Harnessing the power of talk radio. Brandlive.co.za